Today on the lecture 7, we will be starting off with the uh, discretization of the Laplace's equation and we will be talking about uh, various ways of solving this uh, elliptic partial differential equation. The two major categories are direct and iterative methods. Uh, we will note that if we are resorting to iterative methods, uh, although the governing equation is uh, elliptic, we convert it to an equivalent parabolic form and that uh, should tell us that, uh, that numerically we always solve problems which are somewhat different than their physical counterpart. And in this context, we will start our main journey in computing by introducing waves and to understand these waves, we need to understand it in terms of Fourier Laplace transform. We will give you an example of waves by the classical solutions uh, provided by D'Alembert on acoustic waves and how this is related to scientific computing. We will uh, emphasize on that aspect. We will find out that uh, in capturing the waves, we need to worry about uh, the noise or, or the error because this if they are present, they are going to contaminate our signal and at times in many problems, what we notice that the signal and the noise are of same strength. So, it is very essential that we understand the role of the noise. And um, talking about uh, propagation of uh, signal by waves, we need to uh, find out how it is really uh, that this uh, information is propagated. We will identify that in the waves, the signal is transmitted through its phase and energy. That brings us to this topic of uh, dual nature of particle and uh, wave uh, aspect of information propagation. This will be followed by a mathematical description of waves and we would note that there are two different uh, classes, major cl classification one corresponds to hyperbolic partial differential equation. Uh, so, we have uh, already talked about what constitutes hyperbolic uh, problem, namely the existence of real characteristics. In contrast, uh, we can also have uh, waves uh, for which the governing equation would be either parabolic or elliptic or it could be even uh, a problem which is uh, governed by simple steady state uh, equation and we will find out that those systems support waves and those waves are uh, called the dispersive waves. <coughs> As an example of hyperbolic wave, we will uh, talk about the D'Alembert solution of uh, second order bidirectional wave equation, talk about the Cauchy problem and initial conditions required to solve the Cauchy problem and uh, we we'll talk about uh, the definition of this wave packets. Wave packets are nothing but interacting waves which are characterized by the parameters listed here as the wave number k, the circular frequency omega, the wavelength lambda, the phase speed c and the group velocity at which the energy propagates that is given by V g. <coughs> Whenever we talk about wave propagation, we will uh, uh, understand that we could have waves characterized by a single wave number or frequency. That is what we call here as the monochromatic wave. Uh, this would be uh, uh, contrasted with uh, polychromatic waves uh, which will have its distinct spectrum. That is what we will be talking here. And once we uh, know what the spectrum is, we talk about how wave packets essentially forms as a interaction of the constituents of the spectrum. So, shall we uh, start? See, in the last class, we were uh, classifying partial differential equations uh, with the idea that we should be able to get some generic rules for different types of equations uh, because they share some common properties. And we classified those equations in terms of uh, parabolic, elliptic and hyperbolic equations. And uh, towards the end, I of course, uh, warned you that uh, such uh, classifications that you obtain by uh, mathematical tools may not mean very much when you uh, come to compute. 
and as an example we uh, discussed the heat equation and then we uh, noted that it was a parabolic equation, uh, but uh, doing it uh, solving it ex explicitly we noted that uh, we uh, pose the problem not as a parabolic problem, but some equivalent hyperbolic equation. So, then we started talking about another example and that is where we stopped and that was this problem. We uh, tried to solve let us say this uh, Laplace's equation and uh, I would not do it, but you can uh, do it and uh, come back and tell me that this is uh, an elliptic equation. Okay? So, an elliptic equation means uh, it has to be uh, solved as a boundary value problem and uh, I am going to come to elliptic equation much later, but let me uh, remain within the theme of what we are trying to do is to discuss that uh, irrespective of the classification of this equation that is it is an elliptic equation how we go about solving it. So, what I have shown you here uh, trying to solve that problem in a rectangular domain uh, with let us say equispace point in the x direction we have h and y direction we have k as the spacing of the points, then um, writing it in a Cartesian frame and uh, using uniform grid, we have uh, seen that the second derivative could be written like this. right? We have talked about it earlier and now uh, let us uh, for the sake of simplification define 1 over h square as a, b as a minus of 2, plus 2 over h square plus 2 over k square and c as 1 over a square. And then uh, <coughs> let us try to see how we stack the uh, unknowns. <coughs> so, it is a boundary value problem. So, we would be prescribing boundary condition let us say on all uh, four segments of the boundary. <coughs> now, suppose I uh, stack the point in what is called as a uh, lexicographic fashion. But it means that you uh, follow a structure in the way you define the points. For example, I will uh, stack the unknowns like this. This is the first point, this is the second. So, what you do is you go from left to right, then bottom to top. That is the sequence what we are calling as a lexicographic uh, sequence of stacking the points. Uh, having done that, what you could do is you would write down this equation for each one of those unknown points and that would give you a set of uh, coupled equation which I have written it like this. So, please note the sequence u 2 2 u 3 3 uh, u 3 2 all the way up to this point u n minus 1 2 then you go over to the next line which I have not uh, shown that could be like this. So, you start with 2 3 3 3 all the way up to n minus 1 and finally, go to the last line that will start with u 2 m minus 1 all the way up to n minus 1 m minus 1. So, this is your unknown column vector which I am writing as u and these are the coefficients of this uh, in these uh, difference equations. For example, uh, the way we write it uh, what will happen is this i j would go along the diagonal. Okay. And the coefficients are uh, coefficient of the diagonal is given here by b. So, along the b uh, sorry along the diagonal you will get b and what you notice that a point which is uh, to the right of the point in question that would be given by i plus 1 j. So, that has a coefficient 1 over a square. So, that is what you get and the point that is to the left of that point is also a. So, that is what you get. So, you get a kind of a, a tri diagonal band here with the diagonal b and this super and sub diagonal are, are a. In addition you notice that uh, if I am looking at i j then i j plus 1 this point has a coefficient of 1 over c square, uh, k square that is our c. So, we just move a pitch of n minus 1 point because after n minus point 1 point I will go back to the next thing. So, that is your pitch right from 2 to n minus 1. So, 
what happens is this distance is n minus 1 and that is where you get the another diagonal element that is your c and <coughs> you also notice that there is a point which is one pinch below i j minus 1 that would also be n minus 1 on this side. Okay. So, this is uh, a very uh, rudimentary form uh, of uh, this matrix which I may call as A. This is um, uh, called as pentadiagonal, uh, but be aware that uh, uh, what we mean by pentadiagonal matrix uh, may have a much more uh, better structure than this. All the elements would be side by side knots stacked apart like this two uh, sort of uh, I, I would say diagonal slices along uh, uh, lines which are uh, n minus 1 line apart. That is not strictly a pentadiagonal structure. Pentadiagonal structure would probably mean that all of these are together. Okay? <coughs> now, so as you can see that uh, when I am writing this equation for this point, I would have this point, this point this point and this point. These two points uh, belong to the boundary, uh, they contribute to these two terms. So, you can see uh, that you do have uh, a homogeneous equation, but it is linear algebraic form comes out as a inhomogeneous uh, term and this right hand side is contributed by the boundary conditions. Okay? So, that is what you do. Now, if the number of points are let us say n minus 1 in the i direction and m minus 1 in the j direction, then I can define n as the total number of unknown points that is n minus 1 into m minus 1, then the size of the A matrix is n by n. <coughs> so, I am trying to bring this thing to your attention that when you try to solve such a problem, even by the simplest possible means of Gauss elimination, which you may have uh, come across before, uh, how much uh, operations would we require? All of you know that it is all the order of n cube. So, if this is n by n, that is roughly of the order of n cube. So, I think of uh, the following n is say 101 points, m is 101 points, uh, capital N, capital N. So, n becomes 10 to the power 4 and we are talking about 10 to the power 12 operations. right? And uh, you can realize that even such a simple problem uh, is going to be uh, quite a bit of computation. So, what is usually done is you do not try to solve this equation uh, like this. We do not try to solve it like this that A inverse R. So, so that is your Gaussian elimination tries to do. right? It basically gets you the inverse of the matrix. But as I told you that uh, inversion operation or the elimination operation is proportional to n cube and that is a very, very uh, uh, arduous task. We, we, do, we do not like to uh, do that. Instead, what is done historically and even today people prefer is to do it in a sort of a iterative manner. Okay? So, what we uh, try to do is, uh, is not direct solution, but we take some iterative solution strategy. So, what we do uh, is we make some kind of uh, initial guess which could be even the trivial uh, solution which you want to do and then you try to figure out uh, the next level by identifying these uh, two aside. Uh, at n plus 1 -th level while these ones are kept at the previous level. So, this is a uh, simplest possible strategy you can adopt. This is what is called as a Jacobi method. Now, why I am uh, bringing this to your attention is the following that the moment we decide to go over from a uh, direct solution to iterative solution root, this n superscript that we are identifying that I could associate with something a pseudo time. So, it is like your time marching. So, you are marching in n 
direction and when will you stop when successive uh, iterates will not change that would be a wrong thing to do uh, we will talk about it later what we will try to do is we will try to show that we will go to a level where we again compute this difference equation and show that goes to 0. See uh, many a times people make this mistake thinking that if I go from n to n plus 1 and if it does not change that we have converged. This is the word convergence means in a crudest possible sense, but that is not correct because you can adopt a very bad method which shows very slow progression and you come out with a wrong conclusion that I have gotten a converged solution. What you should actually look at is the solution error. So, solution error is take the differential equation, write out its uh, difference form and that should be satisfied. See basically that that is your solution strategy, right. So, you want to ensure that at that level your solution has come to some tolerance level. It may not be exactly 0, you may decide to go to say machine 0 or first uh, well single degree precision or, or you can go to double precision depends on whatever you want to do, but you will have to look at there. So, since uh, one of you asked me to give you a practice problem, so I thought this could be a very nice practice problem for you to do is uh, let me call this as A okay. and second is classified. Well, I have this uh, habit of announcing questions. So, I can tell you I will probably ask a variation of this in your first medicine. So, it is in your interest you should try to solve it. <coughs> okay, uh, so, I have given you some hint that it will not be elliptic equation. So, you will have to find out what it is. That will be the with the theme of this course that uh, what appears on the surface is not what we are looking for. Going back to that Orwell's quotation I give you, gave you that there are issues within issues which we would like to talk about. So, this is one such uh, thing that um, computations uh, mean something which is uh, somewhat different than what you are taught in a focused maths course. So, maths tells you about what is the ideal situation. Here we are talking about what exactly we do and how do we bring that to what we want in a puritanical sense. <coughs> okay, so, this is about uh, uh, classification and to uh, keep you aware that uh, in computations things are different than what you actually expect. <coughs> So, we go over to the next uh, module of our discussion and this is on waves. Okay? And I find uh, that there are many people uh, not only in this campus all over the world, they tend to think that waves are something very special, uh, which is not uh, necessarily true, okay? <clears throat> because uh, information or signal that uh, uh, a physical system carries in many cases they can be written uh, explicitly by waves, which we uh, probably do not have a very clear definition of what wave is or uh, we can uh, represent uh, those so called waves in terms of uh, Fourier transform and you would note uh, that one of the beauty of Fourier's contribution and Laplace's contribution to mathematics has been to able to uh, express any periodic or aperiodic function in terms of Fourier component, Fourier Laplace component. So, uh, what happens? Essentially, those are the prototypical uh, building block of uh, signals which we call as waves. So, that is why I want to uh, talk about it. And uh, many a times the signal strength is uh, very low, uh, they are embedded in noise like uh, you have in sound. Uh, signal and then you know I mean uh, you have to uh, capture them it would be a lot of hard work. 
well we are not talking about the acoustics is here in auditorium which is too loud here we are talking about let's say uh, some spying agency in USA trying to find out when a submarine comes out of a Russian port across the Atlantic. So, you want to pick up such signals, right? Sometimes you would like to be uh, that fancy, and it does happen all the time. So, we are talking about that. See, one of the issues of uh, some of these uh, wave propagation problems are that um, you will have to find them out amidst noise. Well, I uh, just quoted uh, this from my favorite poet. Uh, this is uh, very, very true. Uh, what I am trying to talk about here, let us uh, digress a little bit, uh, going from computing mathematics to a little bit of uh, philosophizing a bit. Uh, what we uh, try to see is our perceived world. We have uh, different hierarchy of uh, observations, right. At the lowest level, what we have is what we call as the data, right. You look around, you see that, that is your data. So, now what you do, the next step uh, is you try to put them in some kind of a sequence, right. So, that would be your information. This is a very nice uh, interesting subject that is uh, being talked about in recent times. Uh, is called, say so suppose you are in a uh, railway station or a airport, there are lots of people are talking about, you pick up uh, the acoustic feed, then you go to your lab and uh, you could hear some 10 people talking simultaneously on different things. Your task is to figure out, convert it into 10 coherent stories, right, 10 groups of people are talking to each other. So, you basically have collected the data from your feed. Now, you are trying to put them in order, right. So, you try to uh, convert them into a set of 10 coherent stories, that is your information. So, it is a ordering of data that takes you to the information level. The next step of course, is the knowledge. You analyze those data, you try to find out that what usually people talk about in this station in this time of the day, is there a pattern. So, you try to generate some kind of, if you are in market research, you try to figure that out, right. People try to figure out what people eat by scavenging their garbage bin also these days, right. So, there are lots of uh, market strategies are there. I hope none of you end up doing that kind of thing. But any uh, sort of distillation of ideas via analysis tool. Uh, takes you to that level and uh, that is essentially your analysis, right. And once you have analyzed, you know at least that topic, okay. This income group people living in this part of the city eats this kind of food, so we should produce this kind of food more. So, that is kind of a knowledge you have garnered for your employer, right. So, that comes through some kind of a analysis. And uh, the highest form of uh, all kinds of knowledge is wisdom. So, what is wisdom? Uh, I looked at around and I found out the psychologists have one definition, philosophers have one, but um, there are no unique definition, but I suppose it uh, relates to something like synthesis, right. So, that um, you look around, around your physical world, you have generated lots of knowledge, you have now synthesized all this knowledge and something comes out, then you say ok, if this is unknown territory, this is the unknown region, I can project that this could happen. Those are the things that you go to the wise people, right. So, wisdom comes there. So, here actually Eliot is uh, asking, where is wisdom that has been lost in knowledge and where is knowledge that we have lost in information and we are going one level below, where is data and data is contaminated by noise. So, one of the theme in this course is to basically uh, finding out how those uh, noise pollutes uh, data and information and from there if we can get something coherent which I may call as uh, knowledge that should come out 
from this course. Okay. So, we basically would like to do that. Now, as I told you that there are no uh, definitions of what really constitutes uh, a wave. This is taken from Witham's book on linear and nonlinear waves. However, um, to understand what it is, we should uh, be able to say that wave motions uh, have the characteristic property that after a signal is observed at one point, you would see a similar closely related event happening somewhere in the vicinity. So, there is some kind of a coherence, correlation between the events happening uh, at one point and its uh, neighborhood. So, basically then we talk about waves as a means uh, by which information actually travels in space and uh, in time. <coughs> now, what is uh, perceived as motion uh, is basically related to uh, the uh, movement of phase and energy, because all of you know, uh, you have been told many a times in your high school even that uh, in many wave motions, it is the particles which do not move at all. Right? It is just that they simply uh, carry a uh, phase information and in the process it can also carry energy, which we will be doing shortly. So, uh, look at it that wave motion is uh, really a broad scientific subject. You can tackle it at any technical level. Um, you can study it as a specialist uh, in any field of science and engineering, which uh, involves uh, wave motion. So, where do we see waves? We see waves everywhere, it is ubiquitous. Uh, some of the common occurrences which you are familiar or, or you have knowledge about is uh, shown here. Uh, the top one of course, uh, all of us are familiar, how water waves are generated uh, by wind blowing over say a confined uh, uh, source of uh, water, say lake or even an ocean then this is something which we have been told many a times propagation of light and sound. Uh, they are uh, uh, really nothing but manifestation of uh, motion, although uh, particle and wave duality uh, that debate still continues. <coughs> uh, you can uh, also see in modern day devices like where you have optical communication uh, in photonics, uh, uh, solitary waves are used to pass on signal we will be talking about it uh, slightly in this course. And uh, people with the aerospace background uh, will tell you about uh, a aircraft uh, flying overhead at a supersonic speed gives rise to some kind of a rattling of the windows, which are associated with um, waves. Uh, the wave has this uh, signature of this letter n, that is why these are called n waves and the phenomena is called the sonic boom. <coughs> uh, those of you are from civil engineering, you ought to be uh, able to find out that uh, some people have actually really looked at how this uh, bottleneck in a, a traffic congestion moves, that itself can be posed as a wave problem. <coughs> then of course, uh, there are other uh, things like flood waves, glacier waves, uh, these are something which we have uh, uh, heard about. Uh, this is something which we have engineered in this uh, last century, blast waves. Uh, created by nuclear explosion, but even if you are looking at uh, the signal, uh, the blood, the way uh, is uh, passed in your artery and vein, they go as a pulse and in circulation physiology, this is sub studied as a wave phenomena. <coughs> uh, there are other wave propagation phenomena in ionosphere that affects um, the communication system, so we are aware of it, even in astrophysics we do uh, study. Well, this is a engineered wave of last century, blast wave. You can see a wave front in the shape of a, a toroid, toroidal cloud is rising above and the stem and the shape is uh, what is called as a mushroom cloud and this is the signature of blast wave. <coughs> now, this is something those of you uh, are not familiar with aerospace engineering would know that uh, for a long, long time uh, people had uh, thought that we will never be able to fly at a speed which is greater than the speed of sound, uh, because of this phenomena. You see this is, uh, this photograph is taken exactly at the time when the aircraft was transiting through the speed of sound. So, this is what is called as a so called a sound barrier, as if there is a barrier and the aircraft has to really go through that. And this phenomena, this is not condensation or any uh, material uh, thing that you are seeing. 
what you are seeing here is a basically the change in the optical property. So, it is a sort of uh, not uh, something that you see some aircraft you may have seen that leaves a trail behind. Those are due to condensation of uh, humidity around, but this is not so. This is just due to the change in optical property and this is the major one that has circumvented and there is a smaller one just behind the cockpit of the pilot that also you can see a small wave coming up there. So, these are shock waves and uh, which we have to uh, really uh, understand in many computational framework. <coughs> now, if we uh, look at waves from a physical standpoint, then uh, as uh, we have seen like any problem in dynamics and vibration, it is essentially a competition between uh, a restoring force and inertia. When you get a perfect balance, then you get self sustained oscillation like your swinging of a pendulum, right? That is where your restoring force is the gravity and inertia if uh, they couple together in a perfect balance, you get a steady oscillation of the pendulum. Okay. <clears throat> now, one class of waves are generated when the restoring forces are due to compressibility or elasticity of the medium. In this case, the particle of the media actually oscillates uh, in the direction of the wave frequency. These are called the compression waves, elastic waves or pressure waves. You may have also uh, talked about it as what? Longitudinal wave, right? So, you also uh, classify according to whether it is a uh, transverse or a longitudinal wave. So, this uh, corresponds to a longitudinal wave. Whereas, the, the waves those are created in water, uh, body of water, uh, those are uh, called the surface gravity waves. There the gravity plays the role of restoration and even you can see such waves in the interior of the liquid. If you have some kind of a density discontinuity, those propagate as internal waves. Uh, what is interesting that uh, here the particles actually are neither describing longitudinal motion or uh, transverse motion, but it is a combination of the two. So, the particles will describe let us say ellipse or circles depending on the depth of the liquid which we will see shortly. So, that is uh, what uh, we look at. Uh, a mathematicians, uh, the mathematician will actually tell you that um, wherever you see waves, they must be a consequence of uh, hyperbolic uh, PDs and when you have uh, such waves, you call them as hyperbolic waves. However, uh, there are also a second class of waves, uh, which we will be calling as dispersive waves. They are there for all possible kinds of PDs and uh, they are dictated upon the space time dependence and that space time dependence is called the dispersion relation when we look at it in the spectral plane, but in the physical plane you have the governing equation itself. right? And it is an interesting thing for you to note that uh, if you look at hyperbolic waves, this dispersion relation will uh, provide you with some kind of a uh, some kind of a uh, real relationship between the wave number and the circular frequency. Okay. So, uh, dispersion relation is something like I will tell you how this omega and k are related. right? Uh, that is what happens in a hyperbolic PD. You have the governing equation in terms of space time derivatives. right? So, there you can convert uh, the spatial dependence in terms of a wave number k or the time dependence in terms of a circular frequency omega and put them in the differential equation that gives you this uh, dispersion relation. That is what we are talking about. However, <coughs> if uh, that is there through the governing equation and that happens to be a real uh, relationship that is what we call as the hyperbolic waves. In some situation you will find that uh, the governing equation does not even have a whip of let us say time dependence, but you still get waves. right? One of the example is the gravity waves. Right? We just now saw the governing equation for the gravity waves 
are nothing but the Laplace's equation, let's say, in its the simplest form. So, that is an elliptic equation, but it still sustains waves and uh, that comes out because of the boundary condition. So, it is rather interesting for one to uh, understand that the, those classifications that we have done in the last class, they relate to classifying the equation based on what we see in the differential equation. The boundary conditions are not being even considered, whereas uh, you can see dispersive waves out of any PDs, uh, that may be a consequence of the boundary condition itself. Right? So, a gravity wave is a very good example for you to understand that the governing equation is an elliptic PD, but it still uh, supports waves. Okay. <clears throat> so, let us uh, do the easier part, hyperbolic waves uh, and this goes uh, way back into history where D'Alembert actually really uh, first looked at this problem, <clears throat> uh, trying to uh, op obtain the first solution. So, talk about this simple wave equation that you must have done in your math course. So, this uh, tells you that u any disturbance its second derivative in time is related to <coughs> the Laplacian of the variable in space multiplied by c square. Uh, c is uh, some kind of a speed and then uh, if uh, the disturbance is simply propagating in one direction, try to make it simpler. So, this could be a 3D problem. So, let us look at its uh, solution in the 1D, that is what D'Alembert did. Uh, so, he tried to solve u t t equal to c square u x x and uh, then you need to solve it subject to some uh, initial conditions. Uh, let me try to uh, get you out of this comfort zone of uh, always trying to think that any p d can be separated the way you want. right? And then what happens is most of the time you end up getting ODEs for each of the independent variable and then what you have the tendency to think of in terms of number of boundary conditions. See if you have noticed uh, in the beginning of this class, I was uh, continuously saying that uh, this problem uh, according to your separation of variable you will say I need two boundary conditions in x, two boundary conditions in y, but when it comes to P d you would be saying that I need only one boundary condition. right? And what happens is this whole thing which you are imagining as four segments essentially constitute one boundary. Okay? So, I will not go into this, leave it to our uh, mathematical mathematician friends to talk about uh, any elliptic P d of order 2 n uh, requires n boundary conditions. Okay. So, if I am looking at a Laplace's equation, I need only one boundary condition that would be uh, this everywhere. Right. So, uh, you know it is very difficult uh, for one to say looking at this equation how many initial conditions, how many boundary conditions you would know after you have separated. So, it is uh, something that I am telling you right now and which we will verify later that this equation that you are seeing here. Uh, requires two initial conditions. Initial condition is adequate for uh, you to define this solution. Right? We'll we'll derive it uh, shortly. <coughs> and uh, let's say we are trying to solve this problem in a infinite domain. So x goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Such a problem we'll call it as a Cauchy problem. Cauchy problem means you are solving the problem in a infinite domain. And uh, this initial condition for the disturbance and its time derivative f of x g of x are uh, considered uh, continuous functions. Okay. Now, uh, if we try to solve that uh, 1D wave equation subject to those two initial conditions, uh, let us define two new independent, uh, dependent wave, well this is independent variable, there is a mistake, it should be independent variable, uh, which we will call as xi and eta. Uh, xi is x plus c t and eta is x minus c t and you substitute these relations uh, in that uh, governing equation and use the chain rule, then you would note that u x x would be u xi xi plus 2 
u xi eta, this is subscript xi eta and uh, this is uh, u eta eta and similarly u t t would be c square times the similar quantity except that the middle term appears with a minus sign. Now, you plug this phi a and phi b in 2, uh, you get the governing equation simplified to u xi eta equal to 0, right. This is what D'Alembert did. So, what happens is then you can uh, integrate it twice. If you integrate it twice, you will get uh, two functions f of xi and g of eta. These are kind of arbitrary uh, twice continuously differentiable functions. Uh, this is what D'Alembert uh, obtained and the solution works out to this, okay. <coughs> because xi is uh, x plus c t and eta is x minus c t. So, this is your solution. All you have to do is uh, figure out what this capital F and capital G are. If, uh, um, well, if F and G are not even uh, differentiable, we can obtain uh, weak solutions. Okay, <coughs> so we will not uh, worry about uh, weak solutions uh, for the time being. <coughs> now, uh, what we need to do is uh, substitute that generic solution that we have uh, just now seen here, six, uh, into our initial condition. So u will give us this, uh, and u t will give us this. Okay, <coughs> where uh, prime denotes differentiation with the argument. Now, if I integrate uh, this equation, then I get f of x minus g of x is this, and k is some kind of constant. Then, uh, what we could do is we can solve 7 a and this 8 uh, to get f and capital F of x and capital g of x in terms of uh, f x and uh, g x. So, effectively you get the solution like this. Now, what you are noticing that uh, the initial solution that was given at t equal to 0 was this f of x. So, the moment uh, you look at its time propagation, you see that uh, it splits into two, splits into two, this part x plus c t moves in the negative x direction, whereas x minus c t part goes in the positive x direction. And this is the contribution coming from the uh, del u del t term. Okay, <coughs> so uh, you know it uh, is a very very interesting equation because it tells you one thing that whatever the initial condition you are given at t equal to zero, whatever f of x that you have, let's consider a uh, simpler case. Well, let's say this part is zero, g of y is zero then everything is determined by this only. Okay. So, the initial condition uh, tells you that it splits into two parts, one goes to the left, other goes to the right and this is what we call as a left running wave and a right running wave. So, x plus uh, c t is the left running wave, x minus c t part is the right running wave that is going in the positive x direction. So, it uh, has some uh, very, very good property what it uh, tells you that the solution at a subsequent time does not attenuate, right? Because what you have done at t equal to 0, the same functional form is propagating in both the direction taking half of the initial part of the solution, right? So, this is a very, very interesting property that um, it does not suffer any attenuation. So, this problem uh, can be solved numerically and we did it. Uh, what we did at t equal to 0, we assumed this kind of a wave packet here, wave packet is something like this. It is basically a wave e to the power i k naught x. Uh, what we do additionally that we make its amplitude decay uh, with uh, around the central point. So, this is going to be some here the central point is x equal to 0. So, that is what we have done. So, in either uh, plus or minus direction, the amplitude decays by this exponential factor, let us say Gaussian distribution, right, minus 16 x square. So, that is what happens. You have the peak amplitude here with uh, x decreasing or x increasing, the amplitude comes down. Whenever you have this, you call this as a wave packet. Okay? So, we will be talking about this wave packet uh, quite often. Now, uh, what we have done, we have taken um, 
delta x as the spacing that is equal to h. So, I have the wave defined by k naught and that we have taken it as equal to 1. This is the way uh, we have uh, defined this. So, we have solved this problem in a um, finite domain for a finite amount of time, but you could uh, uh, do it for a very large domain for a long, long time and uh, try to solve the Cauchy problem. And what you notice as we have uh, seen in the exact solution at t equal to 0, we have one wave packet and at a later time at uh, t equal to 0 0.5, this wave packet has split into two. One part is going to the left, this is uh, to the left running wave packet and this is the right running wave packet. It splits exactly into uh, identical half of the original <coughs> and subsequently as you can see, uh, it goes on separating itself. And as I told you that um, the moment it splits into two, subsequently it just simply does not change its shape. It just goes as coherently as it was originally defined. <coughs> well, uh, basically we try to uh, solve it by one of uh, the method we have proposed along with uh, a little older method and we show that these are essentially the same. So, anyway uh, what we notice that even the simplest problem uh, uh, gives us a very, very uh, interesting uh, set of solutions. Yes. Suppose I am looking at only the right running uh, monochromatic uh, component that will define it as u of x comma t uh, in terms of the amplitude a, in terms of its wavelength lambda and this constant c. Okay. Let us consider c as positive. So, c is basically telling you what? This is uh, either we will write it as e to the power i k x or we will write it in terms of sin or cosine. It means the same thing. So, that uh, exponent or this argument defines your the phase of the function. right? So, you can see with time the phase keeps on changing and the rate at which the phase changes is given by c because it is x minus c t. Right? So, with uh, time the phase keeps changing at the rate of c. So, that is why c will be called the phase speed. Now, I just now told you about wave number. So, wave number is 2 pi by lambda and wave number is nothing but count the number of waves in a phase of 2 pi. Okay? If you have a length of 2 pi, you calculate how many waves you have in there. That is what we will call as the wave number. And the time required for the wave to travel one wavelength is the time period. So, that we will call it as t. That is nothing but lambda by c. So, lambda is distance, c is the speed at which it is propagating. So, lambda by c will be the time period. Now, uh, having obtained the time period, you can always talk about the frequency. Frequency is of course, the inverse of the time period that is this and we can define a circular frequency that is what we have talked about here omega which is nothing but k times c. If you uh, look back uh, 2 pi by lambda here is k. So, we have k x minus k c t. So, k c is uh, termed here as uh, omega. So, basically what we are writing is uh, sin of k x minus omega t in this form. So, that is your uh, phase description. So, circular frequency comes in uh, the way it is uh, changing. So, this is nothing but uh, omega is equal to 2 pi nu. Right? The nu is there. So, 2 pi nu is your omega. <coughs> what we have now so far defined for uh, one dimensional wave, uh, we could also uh, describe it for three dimensional plane waves. So, you will be having variation in the all the three directions in a Cartesian frame. I will write it as k x plus l y plus m z and omega t is that uh, time dependent part we can write it in a vectorial notation of this kind. K vector has this component k l and m such that the modulus is uh, given by this. <coughs> now, there is uh, some interesting property. Uh, if I look at uh, the phase speed, uh, 
here we have uh, defined for this hyperbolic wave, we, uh, in general for wave we have gotten omega equal to k c. So, what we have is basically for 1D wave c was nothing but omega by k, right. So, in 3D something interesting happens. Uh, I will have three components of phase speed, I will call them as c x, c y, c z and c x is omega by k, c y is omega by l and c z is omega by m and look at the curious feature that all these components are uh, greater than the resultant, right. So, this is something, please do not try to apply vector rules to phase speed, hmm? never ever. Uh, now, that is uh, a simpler part. Uh, what is uh, important for us to know that um, it is hardly likely that we are going to come across any scenario where you will have monochromatic waves. You will not have a single component of k or etcetera. What you would have instead is a spectrum, right. Uh, this is something which we uh, always uh, must uh, keep back of our mind that in all realistic system, if I do not do it specifically design it in a lab, I am not going to see a monochromatic wave. What I am going to see instead is what I will call as the spectrum. So, so, spectrum is very, very integral to any of our discussion of a physical system. So, what happens is, let us say talk about uh, this is what we uh, have just written there as uh, let us say capital K. Okay. And uh, let me try to write E of, so this we are doing this, we are just showing with the amplitude of k. So, it is like in the capital K space, we are talking about the whole uh, possibilities, right. Capital K uh, modulus can go from 0 to infinity and we are looking at spherical shells, right. It is like a onion ring kind of a thing, right. You, are, you can peel it and uh, this delta k will tell you how in that band how much of energy is uh, distributed. You generally would find that any uh, system with a finite amount of energy would have a spectrum like this. This is a typical uh, property. So, it just does not go to infinity, because uh, we are talking about physical system, it will have a finite energy. So, you, you can integrate this whole energy that tells you about the total resident energy in the system. So, that has to be finite. So, that is what you get. Now, <coughs> earlier we are talking about a discrete single component. Now, what we are talking about are two neighbors. So, I just call them as k 1 and k 2. Okay. There are these two uh, neighbors are there and we are talking about how do these two neighbors being there together affects the system. Right? So, that is what we are trying to find out. We are trying to track two closely spaced neighboring wave numbers k 1 and k 2. So, k 2 is slightly displaced from k 1 by this amount d k, small amount and they are there simultaneously. So, what you are going to do? You are going to simply just simply add on superposition, right. That is how they would be. Now, we also talk about the dispersion relation, right. We have seen this is uh, one such thing for a hyperbolic wave, the dispersion relation omega and k related by that equation omega equal to k c. Right. So, the moment I have uh, k 1, I have a corresponding omega 1. In the same way, if I talk about k 2, I should have a corresponding omega 2. So, this comes from the, our dispersion relation. So, <coughs> what we are saying that this is a well behaved system. So, if uh, 
k's are related by a small displacement d k, so are the frequencies d omega. Uh, it is a very specific request, but it can be probably uh, extended for even a, if there is a finite jump between omega 1 and omega 2. We can do that, but let us keep the arithmetic simple and say that uh, circular frequencies are also closely spaced. Now, this wave numbers are so close to each other that this amplitude, see the energy is proportional to what? Amplitude square, right, for a wave that we know. So, if this E of k are closely spaced, the amplitudes are also going to be closely spaced. So, we will make our mathematics simpler by taking the amplitude also same. Okay? If I do that, then what do I get? I get the superposition like this. So, A is the same amplitude that I am writing, then I get cos k 1 x minus omega 1 t uh, being superposed with A cos of k 2 x minus omega 2 t. And uh, do a little bit of uh, trigonometric identity and then it will be 2 A cos of this times this part. Okay. Now, that is what happens when you have uh, two entities uh, close by to each other. They uh, tell you the superposition gives you one part which is the second factor. That is almost like the original, right? because original was k 1 x minus omega 1 t. All you have done, you have tweaked it by d k by 2 and d omega by 2. It is a kind of average between k 1 k 2 and omega 1 omega 2. So, that is that is what it is. So, this part is not so uh, interesting. What is interesting is this first part. First part actually tells you the amplitude has not just simply added to 2 a, but it is going to be 2 a times this cosine of this function. And how is this function changing? This function is changing slowly in space and time, right. In space, how is it changing? Remember that k was the wave number and from there I could calculate the wavelength, right that was 2 pi by k. So, in this case 2 pi by d k by 2 will give me a wavelength of 4 pi by d k. Right? And the time period is going to increase to 4 pi by d omega. So, what has actually happened? That two simple waves interacted with each other that gave rise to the phase dependent part, they are almost the same but the amplitude has started changing slowly in space and time and this phenomena is called as modulation. And you notice that this modulation is happening along this. So, if I am trying to track this constant phase path, what should be the speed at which I should be going? That should come out from x by t here equal to x by t equal to constant and that will be something like your d omega d k. So, in a very, very simple ma uh, minded fashion, what we found the amplitude is changing at a speed which is given by d omega by t, d omega d k. This quantity is what is called as the group velocity. So, <clears throat> what we have just now figured out that uh, in a realistic system where there are uh, more than one wave numbers and frequencies involved, we do get groups of events colluding together to show that central path. What is the central path? K 1 plus d k by 2 corresponding omega was this. That actually travels with this kind of amplitude variation. So, Amplitude is related to energy. So, in a real spectrum, you will see it is the group velocity at which the energy propagates, and that is a very, very uh, fundamental relation we should keep in mind. With this, I think I will stop.